Welcome everybody. This is SharePoint Patterns and Practices webcast and this time uh, we're going to talk about how to provision SharePoint assets uh, from your SharePoint framework solution. Uh, the SharePoint framework uh, at the time this video has been recorded went just to G8 uh, pretty recently um, and one of the things what we have in the GA version of the SharePoint framework is a native capability to provision assets whenever the solution package is being installed. Uh, in this webcast we're going to talk about that as one of the options to provision SharePoint assets uh, from your SharePoint framework solution um, and then there's a few alternative options as well so we will walk through individual options and we will deep dive on the feature framework way of doing uh, the deployment or asset provisioning so you will understand the advantages and disadvantages of all of these uh, individual options my name is Rosa Juvonen. I'm a senior program manager from SharePoint Engineering. And with me today, as the person asking all the uh, hard questions, uh, is Valdek. So, Valdek, will you do uh, intros as well? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Valdek Masikas. I work at uh, Red, Red, Red Anchor. I am Office Development MVP. And today, I'll be asking all the hard questions about provisioning SharePoint assets for your SharePoint framework solution. Thank you, Valdek. Uh, we actually forgot about uh, changing a title for this one. It should have been something like uh, the difficult guy uh, asking, uh, interrupting me and asking all a the lawyer. questions. A lawyer. <laughs> no, well, yeah, depends on a, <laughs> depends on a lawyer. So. <laughs> Good. Before we actually go to the, uh, to the content itself and to the demo where we show uh, how this can be uh, done in practice, uh, just briefly explaining what is SharePoint Patterns and Practices. So SharePoint Patterns and Practices is a open source community driven initiative which is coordinated by the SharePoint engineering, but we work together with community like MVPs and non-MVPs, community members together to come up with code samples, guidance documentations. We have community calls, we have case studies. Uh, the, the concentration obviously is in the SharePoint framework, SharePoint add-ins, Microsoft Graph, and Office 365 APIs. And we also cover stuff for SharePoint on-premises. So as an example, the SharePoint adding model guidance is absolutely applicable for on-premises as well, and a future the SharePoint framework as well. AKMS SharePoint PMP is the one address to remember. Now, let's go back on to today's uh, content. So the scenario what we want to actually achieve is that somebody adds a client-side web part on a SharePoint site and the client-side web part actually has a dependency on a list uh, with a content type or specific fields. So how do you get that list provisioned? That's really the key uh, scenario. So the client-side web parts want in certain scenarios, quite often actually, um, they want to store information to the lists uh, in a SharePoint site. So you most likely want to pre-provision uh, the needed fields and content types and list instances for the client-side web part. So whenever you are not dependent on somebody actually creating them manually, because let's face it, that wouldn't actually make any sense. Um, and then whenever whenever you're using client-side web part, what you need to remember is that this provisioning uh, of the client-side web part or these assets is actually happening directly on the specific side, because client-side web parts are not using a concept called app web. The app web or adding web or whatever we want to call that is related on add-ins and add-ins and the, the isolation model of the add-ins. Client-side web parts with the SharePoint framework on the, on the other hand are installed directly on the host web, so to say, uh, even though the host web term is kind of non-used uh, in the SPFX context. Good. Now, we kind of have multiple different options to make this happen. So how do we actually provision the needed uh, fields, uh, content types, and lists uh, to the sites? So the option number one. The option number one uh, is a feature framework uh, way of provisioning these assets uh, whenever the adding or a SPFX solution is being installed uh, on the site. Um, and this essentially happens in a way that when you're creating the SPFX solution, you are defining or defining your element XML files uh, and optional schema XML files for your lists to be deployed or included as part of your SPP KG package, essentially the solution package for SharePoint framework solution. It has a limited set of feature framework elements uh, supported, and we're going to go through them uh, as slightly later on the slides as well. Uh, and when you're actually uh, activating the solution, you do not have to be an site owner to make that happen. 
So as long as you have the rights to the add an uh, app or add an uh, list, uh, so to say, to the site, you can add that app from app catalog to the site. And then the provisioning of this list and the fields and content types will happen using kind of the SharePoint system account. Obviously, the challenge of this one is that this does require deep knowledge of SharePoint internals and uh, those XML structures. Um, so, and it's obviously, is it deep knowledge uh, or is it one-to-one -one on XML sites? But it's, you need to understand some of the feature framework and element XML files to make this happen. Now, the feature framework, uh, if you use this feature framework option with SharePoint framework solutions, that does support elevation. And what that means is that you, the person who's installing the, the solution doesn't have to be an administrator within a site. The flexibility is limited because we only have a subset of uh, elements uh, being supported for this option. Uh, and that is absolutely currently natively available within a SharePoint Online. The second kind of a logical option is that, hey, but okay, that sounds strange because I've, uh, some of you may be not coming from a SharePoint background and you're more used to actually provision stuff using the JavaScript or using the REST APIs. And that's absolutely, uh, absolutely one option as well. So essentially provision the needed SharePoint assets using the native uh, JavaScript in a, uh, in a browser. Um, your permissions where the code is being executed is the current user permission. And this is essentially the challenge with this option. Because if the end user does not have the sufficient permissions who's adding the site, uh, adding the client side web part on the site or the solution to the site, um, or starts using the web part, then the provisioning of those assets would actually fail. And then you need to deal with that within your code. You need to wait until somebody who has the sufficient permissions accesses the site, and then we can get the needed assets actually provisioned. So this, this option does not support elevation, which is no doubt a massive, uh, let's say, challenge for this particular chosen path. The flexibility, however, is slightly uh, more than with the feature framework based uh, provisioning because you can just hit whatever REST, point, uh, REST API points depending obviously on the permissions of the user. And this option, no doubt, is currently available uh, with SharePoint Online. Um, and then the third option, before we kind of kind of open up this for questions and, and while the guys are <laughs> asking hard questions related on the options, is the option where we use a remote provisioning uh, with an external service whenever executed. And what we mean with that one is that whenever you add the web part on a site, it will check if the needed list and asset is available. And when it realizes that, hey, I have a dependency on list, the list isn't here, uh, right now it would actually show an ADAL locking uh, link and you would have to, end user would have to sign in if you want to actually secure uh, that, call, that call from the JavaScript to that external service, for example, hosted in Microsoft Azure. So that way you would be able to secure the web API as an example in Microsoft Azure, and then you sign in using the ADAL Azure AD, then you call the web API in JavaScript, um, and then that remote service calls back on a SharePoint and it can elevate and then provision whatever ever needed on the site for that particular web part. Then on the next time somebody is using the web part, the web part is again checking, hey, is the list available? Oh, it is. Fine, I don't need to show that ADAL uh, locking link and, and that call to my external web service. The challenge obviously with this one is that it, it does require quite a lot of customization. So there's no uh, native way of making this happen. So first of all, you need to implement that custom logic within a client-side web part, uh, as an example, um, uh, where you check if the list is here, then you show the locking, then you call the web API, then you need to implement the web API as well, which, is, which can use app only to call back on a SharePoint and apply uh, the needed settings. So there's quite a lot of bits and pieces in this option and the complexity uh, no doubt increases enormously. On the other hand, the flexi flexibility is unlimited because you are essentially calling stuff outside of SharePoint, outside of SharePoint Online. You're calling to, for example, Azure Web API, uh, and the, the Web API can then take advantage of whatever we have in Azure. And it can take advantage of the CSAM tenant level APIs. It can do whatever needed from that perspective. Well why would you need to use the tenant APIs when you're using a hindsight web part and you want to provision? Okay, maybe that's not, that's a pretty far-fetched option. But anyway, it's an unlimited uh, flexibility to the level of what APIs do we have available in SharePoint Online.
The one thing to call out with this one is that the currently natively available option on this one, we marked that within a yellow orange uh, kind of a, uh, in the middle area there. Um, right now, to be able to call in a secure way a web API which is hosted in an Azure, you need to implement that ADAL call by yourself within your web part or JavaScript which you're using in SharePoint Online. Um, and because the authentication scheme in SharePoint Online and Azure AD is slightly different. We are working on making this much more simplified in the future. Uh, so in, in the SharePoint engineering, we're working on making sure that you can more easily call also third party web APIs or services which are secured by your Azure AD. Today, um, and we are two weeks or one week after the GA, one week probably, uh, time flies, I can't track the date. Uh, but um, today it's still relatively limited. Um, but this will be changed in the future and we'll absolutely do a webcast uh, whenever the new changes are available as well. Now, I know that Waldek has a lot of questions related on, hey, but what about? <laughs> so Waldek, keep it coming. <laughs> Fire away. Fire yeah, so away. First thing that I wanted to ask, and it's a big thing, right? For quite a few years um, already, I think it's three years or more, You've been telling us that we should move away from declarative provisioning and move more towards remote provisioning, and then SPFX GAs, and we see what? Declarative provisioning. What's yes. with that? Yeah, and, and <laughs> absolutely understandable question. So whenever you're provisioning, let's say, sites or site-level uh, operations, um, as in the old school way, we call them site templates or site definitions, you definitely want to use uh, a remote provisioning in the future as well. And we do have awesome community treatment tooling uh, for that one from a PNP, as an example, and other many other remote provisioning frameworks out there. But this is more around um, the initial simplistic way of enabling enabling one list creation or list creation, the, the simplistic list creation for a client side web part. So we, what we wanted to do within the, or what we decided to do in SharePoint engineering side was that, hey, we need to, we need to solve out in a really simplistic way the scenario where the client side web part has a dependency on a list. It requires a list, it requires a task list, it requires a document list or whatever um, to be, uh, to, to, uh, exist on a site where the client-side web part is being used. And the most simplistic way to solve that uh, was really to, um, to take advantage of the existing process and pipeline what we had related on add-ins. So essentially what the model is doing is that it's taking advantage of exactly the same process and pipeline which we used for add-in web but we actually apply the, the settings to the host web uh, natively because the adding web concept doesn't exist in the SharePoint framework. So really, the feature framework uh, when installed option, it is limited uh, and it's it's really for there to address that most simplistic scenario. I want to have a one list with a custom schema. And yes, you can more simplistic way you can do that uh, using the feature framework. Uh, but then whenever you want to do anything more advanced, you probably need to think alternative options. So I guess that, that with that, you also would have to take into account that if you have a web part installed in a site, you could add the same web part even multiple times to one page or actually to multiple pages in a site. Correct. Whereas with XML, you will have only one list. So you, will have, you would have to take into account that that list will be shared amongst multiple instances of the same web part in a site, right? That's a fair point. But to be fair, that same option does, the, or chance, I would say same challenge does apply across all of these options because it doesn't really matter how do you get the web part, uh, the list created. If you design your web part in a way that it can be placed in multiple pages, which yeah, by obviously it can, you need to consider the option, how do you filter the data? And do you filter that based on a page URL in the list or how do you actually, how does the, uh, the functionality actually work? And that's the same challenge regardless of, of which option do you wanna choose. But, um, so I could imagine that when you would do provisioning in code, you could uh, have a separate list created for every instance and then store the list URL or GUI it with the web part and that tie them together to isolate the data Fair point. for the you web part in single list, right? But Fair there point. will be obviously more maintenance, more yes. effort to do that, but there will be an option that you could choose if you wanted to. True. 
No doubt, and that is a valid option. Um, and then you would store, let's say, that in the web part properties. Hey, this is the yeah. list which was created for this particular web part instance. Uh, and then you would have a native uh, filtering. Uh, you might, in a worst case scenario, you might up, end up having quite a few lists in your site to be created if you have multiple pages in your site. But again, it's a matter of a choice. This is not a black Absolutely. and white, black and white, let's say, this is right, this is wrong. No, no, no. It really comes down on how do you want to implement stuff and how do you design the architecture of your custom solution right so with with with, with that imagine that i create uh, a, um, assets for for the web part when i install it um, in the in the site or i edit to the page is there a way for me to clean clean them up when i remove the web part so whenever you are moving the web part or the solution from a site, because the web part comes available and visible in a site whenever you install that web part uh, to the site at the site level. Uh, and, and that's a good point to remember. It's a site level, not a site collection level installation. So whenever you add the web part to the site, we provision uh, the elements. And that would be applying to all of these three options, actually. Uh, whenever you are uninstalling uh, that the SPFX solution for the site, there is currently no events being raised uh, as part of that. So there's no way of calling a next general set of services. Hey, the solution has been uninstalled. Then that means that all of the existing data which was uh, created to the site using the client side web port would still remain in the site. Now, for the future, yes, good, looking right? into, that is good because we're not deleting anything. Uh, and to be, to be honest, when I think about it, um, if we go back on the feature framework time frame or farm solution time frame, that was pretty much exactly how the farm solutions worked. We never actually deleted lists. We never actually deleted content type if they if there was data related on those content types. Um, there are certain, well, let's say, scenarios where we deleted some configurations, but we never actually deleted content because deleting a content is actually, well, a horrible thing because then you can yeah, accidentally um, delete an actual content. Yes, and actually that's the whole thing, right? Because the content is not the thing you own. So sure. in, uh, if, even though you have built the web part and you've built the assets to support it, the content is is created by, by users and they own that. And even though they remove the web part, they should still be able to access the content, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And then the, the end users can decide what they want to do with the content. The people who own the site, they have the ownership of, of deleting or access and permissions to delete the site, uh, content if they want. So, for example, lists uh, from the site. So, as, 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 as you said, you install the web parts uh, on the scope of a site. So that means that features you create are, are also scoped to the site, right? Correct, yes. So with that, Actually, what we are doing is, and I've, I've heard you say that you can create fields, content types, and lists. So all of that would be created on the level of a site, right? Correct. Absolutely. So, so, so if I understand that correctly, across different sites in the same site collection, you will have the same content types, but in different instances of them, uh, deployed across the different sites within without a central location to manage them. So you, you could end up in a scenario where site A has the web part version 1.0 and site B version 2.0, and the content types that they use are not compatible. So you couldn't exchange the info across two web parts. That is absolutely is that true. So, so um, it is a classic uh, recommendation within the SharePoint that please do not actually provision web scoped uh, content types and fields. In the case of client side uh, client side cl uh, web parts, that would be actually what's happening. Uh, if you take advantage of the of these options, what we're presenting actually in here, and let me come back on the on the more let's say enterprise ready scenario in a second as well. But what what that would definitely mean is that in a worst case scenario, you might actually have a different versions of the content type used across your site collection. If you have a large site collection and you're using the web part inside of the individual subsites, and no doubt that would be a operational and and let's say maintenance challenge. Uh, uh, for the future because you might never know which are the content types on which site. Well, to be fair, because the content type is getting deployed by the client side web part, you can manage uh, what, what version is being used by looking into the, the web part which is being used within the site. Um, but it does raise some additional maintenance challenges. Now, on that one, we don't actually have a slide on that one, but that, that's a good uh, good discussion topic, what Walter asked. If 
you are really looking into the, let's say, the deep dive, hardcore enterprise development scenarios where you own the site creation, where you own what's getting deployed on the site collection level uh, and, and to the site levels as well. You can actually take, uh, you can actually guarantee that you have the right content types and fields across all of your site collections. So therefore, in that kind of a scenario, when we talk about enterprise deployment, development, you do not necessarily need to deploy the content types as part of your web part because you can assume that they already exist as long as you have that centralized uh, site collection provisioning uh, engine. Again, not a black and white discussion and really comes down on, on thinking through the different options, complexity levels, the costs related on the, on the individual approaches. Right, and um, so another thing that I wanted to ask, right? Imagine that uh, whenever we write code to create stuff, we can deal with errors and we can check if things are there. How do yeah. we de deal with that in XML? So imagine that provisioning fails at some point. How yes. can we see what's been done, what's not, and, and in case of, of, of a failure, does it go all the way back, or are we stuck with some things provisioned and the others not, and we have to deal with that in one way or another? So in the case of using the feature framework with SPFX uh, solution packages, you, if the solution package installation to the site fails, um, it is essentially the same UI as for the, for the add-ins because the, the solution packages are actually deployed using the add-in catalog as well. You will see an exception. You will see essentially this package uh, did not install properly. You are able to go to the details and you're able to see Microsoft internal uh, SharePoint uh, online internal exception around what was the uh, reason for failure of the installation. Now, will that explicitly tell you what was the path, which was wrong or something else, what was wrong? Um, it depends. Quite often, uh, those people who've been working in on-premises and farm solutions, they, they actually know that SharePoint isn't necessarily always giving us uh, super informative exceptions. So it might be uh, that, it's, that it's really difficult to figure out what actually goes wrong within your deployment. Okay, cool. And um, imagine so. Imagine that I have built everything and it works, and at some point in time I want to, uh, to, to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to update it. Um, what are the options that I have uh, from XML point of, of view to, 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 to update the assets that I created in the past? Yes, so we do have a slide actually coming up after the demo on that one as well, but that's, that's a fair question. So we, so we do support uh, feature framework upgrade actions, uh, declarative upgrade actions, uh, which were introduced back in SharePoint 2010 timeframe. So it's exactly the same story as with SharePoint add-ins. So if you've done the upgrades uh, with add-ins, these are this is exactly what happens with uh, SharePoint framework uh, solution packages as well, except that we do not support any code-based upgrade operations for the time being. So you can actually do apply element manifest and then you are able to do add field to content type uh, as a custom action. Now those are the declarative custom actions which are available when you are upgrading for example from your package version 1.0 to 2.0. Now in the future we're looking into absolutely we are aware of this challenge as well. So we're looking into having more let's say code based uh, ways of doing your upgrades as well, most likely using webhooks as an example, one of the scenarios what we're looking into. But we don't have timelines for those at this point. But absolutely in the in engineering, we're looking into improving this model uh, for the for the solution packets ALM processing as well. Um, the one la la last thing before you're going to show us how it works, I wanted to ask is when you build the uh, the XML. Uh, do you get any help, IntelliSense, and is all of that being checked during the build, or so what, to, to what extent the framework is going to help us build that XML correctly? Well, for right now, it slightly depends on the tooling what you're using. So when you're creating the XML itself, technically you could use a Visual Studio and hook in that XML to an XSSD. Typically, you would be using Visual Studio Code. A Visual Studio Code actually doesn't have any uh, schema validation or, or looking schema adaption or schema linking 
for XML files, which would mean that you, you wouldn't have intelligence when you're actually creating the, the element XML files. Um, but it, it does slightly uh, depend on the tooling, what you're using to create this element XML files and schema XML files uh, for custom list instances as well. Um, for the, what was the second question? Already forgot about that. See? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, to what extent would the framework help you validate that, oh, that yes. all the yes. XML is correct? So whenever you are then packaging the solution, whenever we run the package solution for, for SPFX package, we do not do validation at that point. Uh, when you're installing the, the SPPKG file, the, the app catalog, we actually do a validation. So at that point, we run through the basic validation of the element XML files. We do not check the logic of those files, but we, for example, check that the paths uh, within the files are correct and, and you're pointing to the right files and all of that within the within the manifest file but that's that's pretty much the level of a validation which we have right now uh, and that's one of the things which we're looking into getting feedback from the community right now is is the, the improvements of the tooling so what kind of additional tooling uh, support would be needed what can we do what can we source to the code guys do uh, and what about the other options as well cool so with that how about we have a look how does that work in practice Sounds good. Good questions. Uh, good questions. And let's quickly have a look on this. Before we go to the demo itself, just to quickly pointing out uh, on the feature framework element support uh, for SharePoint framework solutions. So we do, do support fields, content types, list instances, and list instances with custom schema. And I want to explicitly call that one out. That does not mean list templates. It means that as part of the list instance, we are creating a list and provisioning time using an alternative schema. It does not mean a custom list template which would be a template available uh, within a site because that has then additional implications. So the, the supported set of uh, capabilities are relatively small, um, but they are addressing that simplistic scenario that, hey, as part of this client-side web part, I'm going to create a list which has the basic content type or, or these fields inside of it, and I want to make sure that that exists. And voila, that's the scenario what this one is addressing right now. So the one thing that I want to ask about that, about the one that you wanted to point out. So imagine that I would build a web part that ships with a list, a custom list, right? And I remove the web part, I remove the package, the list stays behind, but not the package. Can I open open the list and access it, or yes. not because the package is not there anymore? So whenever you whenever you use the list instance with the custom schema option, which we're going to do in the demo as well, uh, you can actually retract or delete the solution instance from a site, and the list will still work without an issue. So this is not a list template. The list template would actually uh, mean that you're creating a, a list instances based on schema XML. Whenever you retract, the schema XML is no longer available. Therefore, the list instance would have options. This is something completely different, uh, which we unfortunately didn't successfully implement in the Visual Studio tooling at some point. So people are not that familiar of this option. But I'm going to show that one in practice uh, when we go through the demo as well. Cool. Do it. Cool. Let's go to the demo. Let's see that code. Um, and, and what I'm going to do is that I'm going to actually, I'm going to um, be fully open and honest. I have a ready-made solution on my left screen. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to build uh, the solution uh, on, the, on the screen, what, what's just being shared with you. So you can actually see how we built the solution step by step. Uh, we do have a ready to, uh, solution for the solution sample for this one in a GitHub as well, which is showing exactly how to get stuff provisioned whenever the, the it is getting deployed. So, in other words, in uh, enterprise terms, we'll, you will see a lot of editor inheritance implementing new working <laughs> solutions. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Good. Um, so, what I've done here is that I've, I've simply created a, a empty solution, and this is a empty solution using the, the basic JavaScript uh, framework. We're not actually going to implement anything in a web part uh, level, so it doesn't really matter what we what template we are using because we actually play with uh, the solution package, um, which is now our objective for this particular demo. So, what I'm going to first do, uh, well, in my case, I'm going to actually create first a SharePoint folder. Uh, and underneath the SharePoint folder, I'm going to create an assets folder. And this is the folder where I'm going to actually uh, 
puts all of my element XML files and schema files and so on. So our build tooling, whenever we are uh, running the build, back, build the package, it will automatically look for uh, element XML files and upgrade definitions from this particular folder. Um, if you, uh, well, if this SharePoint folder is familiar for you, that's probably because whenever you are doing a package solution, it will actually create the SharePoint folder for you and then a a solution folder underneath that one uh, where you're going to find the SPP, G, key, G, Q, I can't pronounce it. PPD. PD, CD, PD file. Good. Um, so, so good. We have a location for our assets. So let's actually uh, create a few assets. And, and what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to, like mentioned, I'm going to be super, uh, well, fast and lazy, but what I'm going to do is that I'm going to use the exact same assets what we have within our reference sample, which I think I published a few days ago before the re video was recorded. So I, I know that it's actually live. Um, and we kind of link that uh, sample in, uh, in our uh, video notes as well. So you will find that easily. So, but let's quickly run this through because not that maybe there's people who are not familiar with what we're doing from a feature framework perspective. So element XML file is something which is defining uh, essentially for SharePoint that, hey, SharePoint, um, I have this custom solution uh, or custom definitions. Uh, whenever you activate me, I want to have certain custom things. Uh, and the element XML file uh, then actually defines what are those things or elements which we need to have. By using the SharePoint framework classic uh, schema, uh, uh, the, the feature, what do we call this, camel schema, uh, feature framework schema. Uh, and in this case, we are creating a one field uh, called uh, amount. It is internally using SPFX amount as the field name. Uh, it's going to be grouped in the SPFX columns, uh, and it's going to be a currency typed with the two decimals. The second field uh, is going to be a cost center. Uh, I'm going to, uh, by default, well, it's good practice to use a prefixing, uh, which are unique, uh, so you're not over, over mapping with anything uh, existing fields in the, in the site as well. Um, and for that one, it's a choice field, uh, and we're using administration information uh, and as, a, as the values. Uh, I could do default choice here as well, but as you can, uh, as you can see, there's no uh, intelligence, which is a pity, uh, but I'm not gonna do that just to uh, make sure that the, I don't actually mess up anything from my editing the, the demo. I'm being lazy now. I want to be 100% sure that everything is working. Now, and then I'm, what I'm doing is that I'm introducing a one content type, uh, which is called cost center. Uh, and it's going to be underneath the SP content type group description. Uh, well, it's sample content type, but it actually references those fields which we just provisioning in here. The key point here to remember is that we provision stuff from a top to down. Uh, so you need to ensure that because the content type is referencing those fields uh, in from here, uh, we need to make sure that these fields are first being provisioned uh, before the content type is being provisioned. Classic feature framework uh, story as well. Um, in, in the past, we were allowed to split all of this apart. So you could have one, one element file for fields, one for content, one for list. Are we still allowed that or can we, all, can we only have one file and that has to have everything in it? You can have multiple files and you can still define the order uh, of those files within a feature. So that does uh, work as well. So uh, it's just in this particular case, I only have a few items. So it's a one file uh, from a simplicity perspective, but you can have multiples. Yep. Okay. And then uh, in here, uh, we have a list instance, uh, list instance, which is based on a template type 100. That's a, a the, the custom list, the basic list uh, without anything else. But what's actually interesting here is that I'm using a custom schema attribute. So essentially what I'm saying is that, hey, create me a custom list, but in a provisioning time, use this alternative schema XML. So do not use the native schema XML of the temp uh, list template 100. Use this alternative schema XML, which I'm going to actually give you. And as you can see, we do not have a schema XML yet. So let's actually create a schema XML to this folder as well. So let me actually create here and create a schema XML. Schema XMLs are super complex and super, uh, let's say, um, annoying as well, uh, because these schema XMLs, for feature XML, uh, we do have a proper schema. You can actually associate the XML file to a schema. You can write with intelligence, for example, in Visual Studio. Again, depends on your tooling, what you're using. For schema XML, 
that uh, schema file does not actually natively exist because, well, the reasons are another for years and years of evolution in SharePoint, we are in the situation which is not optimal. But um, you can um, pretty much see uh, what, what's happening here as well as from a simplicity perspective. So we're defining a list. Oop, let's not actually do that. Uh, it's a basic list. That title is not relevant in this case because we're overriding that in the list uh, instance element in the elements XML file. But what I'm doing is that I'm referencing that content type, which I'm actually creating in the elements XML file as well. So what I want to do is that I have this list created which actually has by default uh, these fields SPFX amount and SPFX cost center in the uh, in the list and also in the default view. And then uh, some basic definitions for the for the view part uh, which is needed. Super simplistic schema XML file. These files can be super complex. This file can be painfully complex um, uh, if you're uh, familiar with SharePoint uh, in general. And no doubt an area where we need to get maybe better tooling, maybe better uh, explanation. There is good stuff and good documentation out there in the internet around the schema XML file as well. The feature XML so, elements all documented in a really good level. So the one thing that I wanted to ask about, and I'm aware that I'm, I will put you here a bit, a bit on the spot, is yeah. for the schema XML for the list. Is everything that we could have done in the past will also be supported in the the, uh, the modern list in modern sites, or are there pieces that we should not use because it might work in classic site but not in modern site, a modern um, list? So, as a rule of a thumb, um, maturity of the well, yeah, and and I'm I'm moving back on my my consulting times and saying something which is it depends. Super, yeah, it depends. <laughs> um, so as a rule of the thumb, um, the basic configuration in the schema XML absolutely works uh, in the modern uh, list as well. Now, if you would use the schema XML, which works 100% uh, in classic, um, it will you can provision lists using that in the modern sites as well. But it might be that some configurations will be ignored by the modern list UI. Uh, some of the, the known capabilities, well, some of the, there has been some gaps in the modern list and libraries, and those are being addressed gradually, and, and those things are being light up here and there um, as we move along. So you can anyway provision the list. Will all of the settings have a meaning in the modern list? That's a different discussion. That's a different, right. uh, let's say, topic. Okay, but at least creation time, you won't have any errors. Correct, correct. Uh, so anything in a classic schema, you can still use that in a creation time. Uh, what will be then visible in the modern versus classic, that's a different discussion. Okay. Good. So we want to have a list uh, with those three fields uh, by default in the default view. Uh, in here, we created the two, uh, two fields. There was the title field as the third field. And we have a, a content type. We are creating a list instance and saying, hey, that's the schema XML, uh, which we want to actually use for creating this uh, instance uh, to the site. Good. Now I need to actually make sure that this stuff is getting packaged as part of my package. And so I need to actually modify uh, my package uh, solution, JSON files in the config folder. So let's actually come in here. This is defining essentially what is the name of my solution. Uh, so for example, feature solution SPP uh, G, and what is the version of my solution file? Essentially same as let's say adding version back in the adding time frame or uh, farm solution version when we were back in the on-premises time frame. So in the package solution, I need to extend this slightly. And I'm going to copy this uh, directly again from the sample which we're having. Uh, so I will actually get it absolutely right uh, because, uh, well, you can easily do typos uh, with this one. And I'm being lazy. Oh, not that one. Give me one second. That looks scary. So <laughs> here uh, and put that one in. So. Inside of the feature element, uh, I'm introducing features uh, collection, which actually implies, like it does, that you can actually have technically multiple features uh, there as well. Um, then we have a title of the feature. Uh, this will be visible uh, in the UI as well. So we can actually call this whatever we want. Let's call this, uh, let's actually copy that one. So that we're not always using hello world feature solution. Let's have uh, feature solution, feature solution, feature, feature, feature. Um, <laughs> feature. 
feature it provisioning. It can get pretty fast uh, complicated. <laughs> yes, it, it can. Feature provisioning needed uh, assets to SharePoint. So uh, if I understand correctly what you said, this feature will be available in or will, will be, be, uh, be actually shown in the UI. But correct. if I recall correctly, the feature that, that actually, uh, or was it in a past, that in a past there was a feature that deployed the dot web part file, file to gallery and that is not visible anymore. Because um, that one was, was, I, I, um, 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 the feature uh, was not visible in UI, so right. I wondered so, if that one is being shown or or not. No, so let me actually. That's a good point and good clarification. Back in the time before we did a a really uh, GA, uh, or actually even before release candidate one, as part of the packaging of the solution, we actually did package uh, a .web part file as part of the web part client side web part file. We no longer do that. So we are not actually deploying a .web part file as part of the feature. Uh, the web part gets visible in the site level using a uh, different mechanism. So we don't actually need to have the .web part file uh, anymore. This feature will be visible in the site features uh, list if you go there. Uh, you do not need to modify the default settings or the descriptions or titles because, well, let's face it, nobody should go and deactivate this or activate these features, even though, well, maybe some end users do and then they might have some challenges, but that's a different discussion. Good. But I can imagine that that, that, one, that that might be a valid option to check whether everything has been installed correctly, right? Correct. Just to see Correct. if that thing is is enabled, right? Yeah. Because you might have um, backup and restore automation process, and there are many things that could af uh, um, affect it. So being a, um, able to, to actually see whether it's enabled or not might be like, like the first step that you would take in order to see if everything works as ex 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 expect accept. Correct. Correct. Uh, and we could actually call this something like SPFX feature solution, so you can always easily find that from the feature list as well. Uh, every feature has to have a unique ID. Uh, I'm going to use the same unique ID as uh, I used for the other one. It doesn't really matter in this case. Um, and then I'm referring to element XML file and schema XML file. So notice that I'm not actually pinpointing that they are in SharePoint assets folder. I'm essentially the tooling is assuming that they are in the assets folder on inside of the or as a subfolder in the SharePoint folder. Um, and then if uh, needed, I would be able to actually extend this with uh, upgrade actions. Uh, but in this case, we're not going to actually do this. Uh, upgrade action fields, if I remember correctly, uh, what's the right definition? I'm going to reference the, the current documentation in the video webcast, uh, video notes as well. So that would be then related on the upgrade actions when you're upgrading uh, across the versions. So is this uh, the place when you can specify the order in which the files are being uh, loaded? Correct. So I would be able to actually have here uh, multiple elements file. Uh, so here uh, that would be then elements three and that would be elements two um, and they would be actually queued up uh, in the right order in the tool. So we would process stuff in a one, two, three way. Not based on the number, based on the, the existence. The order. Exist. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Good. Let's actually, oh, let's get rid of those. And there we go. Uh, I think we should be fine with this one. Uh, there's no, nothing more than this to be done. We have the element XML files. We have the definition for the underneath solution. I think we're good to go. Way. So. Ship it. Ship it. So let me do, uh, this time I can do gulp uh, package uh, solution. And this will essentially then read uh, the package solution JSON file, and it will create the internals of the feature, internals of the file. It will package me the SPPPKG file, as we can see in here, uh, which will then contain all of the needed assets and everything else. If you're super interested on in what's happening inside of the engine, uh, you can actually see those files. So you don't have to extract that SPPKG file. You can go underneath the solution folder where you can find the file. Uh, you can go to the def debug folder. You can actually find uh, the, the XML files which were being packaged in here. We can see that we have the schema XML file correctly here. So the tooling was able to recognize that. Uh, we have a feature definition here. Uh, we have a fe another feature definition here. There's our SPFX feature solution. There's our description looking all good. Uh, scoping web, 
uh, like we mentioned in the past. And then you're able to see the individual element XML file, for example, in here. The other element XML file is the definition of the Hello World web part. So this is essentially the client side component, uh, which is a type of Hello World web part, uh, sorry, type of a web part right now, as we can see in here. Because in future, there will be alternative or other types as well, not just web part. So in other words, the feature is there, but it, but it does not deploy anymore the, the dot web part file to gallery, right? There because there's no the, 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 dot the, web part file. Yeah. yeah, there's no yeah. dot web part file uh, in here. So the definition yeah. of the web part itself is essentially this one. Right. Um, and the one thing I wanted to ask, because if you would open the feature XML for the feature that you, you've, you've built. Oh, let's do that. Yep. If you look, look at that, there is no reference from here to the XML that we've, we've, we've built. So how Fair does point. the engine know which elements to load here? Yes, and that's a really, really good uh, question to actually cover in this video as well, because we don't probably then cover that too much detailed in the, in the uh, documentation. What actually happens is that we are taking advantage of RELs and relationship files. So in the, in the classic development, you were actually defining uh, the element XML files in here. So you were using uh, element uh, file, uh, element uh, file, and then you reference that file um, somewhere uh, and all of that, and upgrade definition here as well. In our, this tooling, all of that is taken care of. So you don't actually need to do that. You don't need to do all of that manually associating things. We essentially read what's in the package solution JSON file. And then we create this relationship files. And these are the relationship files. Uh, relationships is a really classic uh, XML definition for feature framework as well. And this one is actually uh, defining, for example, that we have a feature element manifest, uh, which is uh, that one. Uh, which is for uh, for the web part. We do have a feature element manifest, which is, uh, sorry, we do have a feature element file, which is schema XML. Uh, and we do have a feature element manifest, which is the manifest, uh, manifest, which is the, the one which we manually created. So cool. when we activate the, the solution, it is still based on the exactly the same classic uh, feature framework and everything else. Um, the activation essentially is just reading these and then knows uh, the relationship between the elements and activates that uh, properly. Let's see this one in practice quickly. Uh, so I think we went through how we can do that. So I'm going to actually reveal uh, this folder in Explorer. Um, not open, reveal. Um, and then I'm going to deploy this to, to the SharePoint. So let me actually start go back on my SharePoint site. This is one of the one clean uh, theme sites, a native out of the box SharePoint uh, theme site in SharePoint Online. So let actually, let's actually get that solution installed. Here we go. There's our solution. Uh, and let me actually uh, do that. Uh, there we go. And I can track and drop uh, the solution file in. And here we go, the solution file is getting installed. Uh, I'm getting that right uh, dialog. If this doesn't actually happen, you know that there's something wrong within your feature uh, within your solution file, either in a feature framework or in some other uh, sections of your solution file. Uh, the fact that you're getting this uh, dialog means that, hey, it is recognizing that properly as a client-side solution. If I do deploy, uh, it actually says in here as well, that this one is a valid uh, package. And that means that it has been validated to package, that this default references and everything else is working properly. Good. Solution package deployed. So let's get this one then uh, activated within our clean site, uh, clean SharePoint site. Let's go to the site contents. And in here, as an end user, I don't need to have the sufficient permissions to create lists because we're elevating when we're running this code in the feature framework. So I'm going to choose feature solution, client side solution, which is the one which we just created and uploaded. Uh, let's install this one to the site. And that's getting installed using the, the classic, let's say, adding model uh, process, except that we're not creating an adding web or app web, and we're not applying those feature framework elements to the adding web or app web, uh, whatever we want to call that. What happens here, if I refresh the UI, uh, we're actually applying these modifications directly on this particular site. 
so to say, host uh, web, uh, but in the SPFX world, we don't have a term called host web. Um, that's more for the adding model. The activation of the of the solution can take a while. Now it didn't take too long. Uh, I was just about to talk about to have a pause on the video. And now it's activated. If I refresh, uh, we can see that we have an SPFX list, which was the list instance, uh, which exists now on the site. If we go to this list uh, itself, uh, we can actually see that we have a three items in the, in the list. I can create a new item and I can see that I have an amount field. I have a cost center field with the right values. Uh, let's call this and that will say currency so it's not going to actually accept even others I can do numbers and just save and we can see that when within our list view we have a default uh, rendering for this and for that amount we said that it's a currency field and it has two decimals in our definition and really like mentioned that the key point of this yes it may, it may be sounds kind of a Fungi that where we can use the feature framework with SharePoint framework, uh, SharePoint framework solutions as well. But this is for addressing this particular scenario. I want to have a really simplistic list uh, with the specific fields um, created whenever the client side web bar is getting installed on the site. Uh, and now when the client side web bar is being used on the UI, uh, this list exists uh, and nobody has to manually create that or we don't have to run JavaScript to actually get it created. So all good from that perspective. And obviously, if we want to just double check final things, if we go to the site settings, uh, site columns, we can go to the list of SPFX columns. Uh, we can see those two fields uh, being available uh, in here. Or if I go back on the, on the content types, we can also see our custom content by was actually uh, properly deployed uh, in the content type option. Any questions, Walden? It's working. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why are why are you you're so surprised? Come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, as, as you as you said, right? It is uh, the probably the easiest way to provision assets that the web part that you build might need. Um, um, yeah, and there are pros and cons to it. Um, so, so oh yeah, I, I guess that at the end of the day, you should you, sh you should think about it as another tool in your toolbox that might be good for some scenarios, but not the best for others. Right? Yes. Well, that's that's always true within the SharePoint, um, and that's I've always personally said that I don't believe anybody who is presenting best practices sessions in conferences because. You can't. It's impossible to define best practices for almost any technology uh, because best practices depends. Is this a best practice to deploy a list or is, is the, the remote provisioning model best practice to deploy a list? Well, it depends. Are you writing a most simplistic web part or are you writing a hardcore enterprise solution uh, for a large customer? The story is highly dependent uh, on, a, on, a, on, let's say, the skill set of the, of the developers and what is your business objectives. Cool. So uh, let's actually move on. And, and just the final thing, we kind of mentioned this one already. Waldek asked uh, a question around this one, uh, so around the update and upgrade story. Um, the model does support also a usage of the feature upgrade actions, so the apply element manifest and the add content type field. Uh, it is, isn't a massive amount of, of elements which are being supported, um, but those are the classic declarative options which we've been having for SharePoint add-ins as well. Uh, the, these upgrade actions are being processed when the instance of the site is being upgraded. So it doesn't mean that when you're in the same way as with add-ins, whenever you were installing a new version of the app catalog, um, that's not when we actually apply uh, this, these modifications. You need to actually go to the site level and do an explicit upgrade. Um, and that then raises the, the follow-up question, hey, but wouldn't that require that I need to go to all of the sites and do the upgrade manually one by one? We know the challenge and we are looking into addressing that by introducing ALM, uh, ALM uh, APIs to actually being able to then upgrade these instances automatically across your, uh, across your tenant. But right now, so, it is exactly the same model as with sharing, uh, SharePoint adding model. So, so the one thing related to that I want to ask is that if I recall it correctly, in the past or uh, even now still with 
add-ins, there was the option to deploy add-in within the catalog, and that would deploy the add-in to all sites, correct? Correct, yes. Could, could you use the same approach with SPFX? Um, <coughs> um, so that that is an answer is so quite simplistic. Answer is no. Uh, that that option does not unfortunately work with uh, SharePoint uh, framework uh, solutions. The reason why it worked, uh, well, the difference is actually the way how the adding model works with an add-in web and the add web, uh, whatever app web add. -in whatever it's called, app web. <laughs> um, the, the model what, what Valdek is referring is the, the centrally deployed or tenant level deployed uh, add-ins where you actually create an instance of the add-in to the catalog site and then you push that instance to be visible across the sites. Um, but what happens with that scenario is that you're essentially adding a link to that app web across all of the sites within your tenant. Um, in the case of SharePoint Framework solutions, you actually need to get the stuff provisioned to the individual sites. Um, and so we will get the instances, everything else uh, deployed to that particular sites. And so that model does not unfortunately work. Um, but whenever we get the ALM uh, APIs uh, available, then you can actually start automating uh, deployments across the tenant, across all of the sites if needed, or upgrades uh, and, and more control in general uh, for SharePoint framework solutions. Sweet. Good. Quite a lot of talking, quite a lot of demos, but I think one of the key objectives of this webcast was to really walk through the whole process uh, carefully one by one. The only aspect which we did in deep time was the upgrade, uh, upgrade, uh, upgrade action or upgrade uh, process. And we will absolutely document that as well. So that will be in a, in a lab, unless the lab is already available when you're watching the video, uh, in the devtedoffice.com slash SharePoint. So you can actually understand also how would I then update this kind of an app uh, adding, or sorry, not an adding, SharePoint Framework solution, which uh, <laughs> had a feature framework uh, elements inside of it. We, would, we wanted to skip that one in this call uh, webcast because, again, we've been talking way too much already. Uh, <laughs> but it's better to reference that one uh, as a written uh, lab in the in the documentation. Anything? Uh, what? Anything else? What we want to cover, Waldek? Any questions? Any? Any? You didn't actually ask any hard questions. I'm not going to tell you what are the hard questions. No, just kidding. <laughs> also, to close it off, I'd like to re reiterate it that declarative provisioning is yet another tool available to you, but it's not recommended or a best approach or just it just an approach that you should think about and you should decide whether to use it or not, whether it applies to you or not. So it's you should never blindly stare at it and say, I'm going to do it or I am not going to do it because X, but just think about it, think through about whether it's going to add the value to your solution or, or not. Yes. Because at the end of the day, it's just a tool that you can use, but you don't need to use. Correct. We there is multiple options of making this business or technical requirement uh, or tackle this technical requirement. Analyze your requirements. Analyze the options. Make a choice, uh, and and based on the knowing uh, what the option actually means for your solution as well. Um, and we'll absolutely understand. We'll absolutely need. To, uh, well, We'll improve the documentation on these options as well, and maybe to get a more written guidance uh, on those three options and how to make all of those three options happen in practice as well. But in general, uh, happy hacking, happy SharePoint framework development, and uh, I think that's it uh, for this webcast. So uh, thanks for watching, and thank you, Waldek, for joining me, and we'll come up with a new webcast sooner or later. Thank you. Bye.